welcome to section 4.14 and 4.15. So to start this off, we're going to discuss the idea of probability, which is really key to understanding genetics as a whole. So if I take a coin and I flip that coin, see what it is, and then do it a second time, the idea here is how many times would I get heads? And normally most people would say once because they figure, all right, this is a 50-50 shot, meaning that half the time I should get heads, half the times I should get tails. But the funny thing about probability is it really is intended to work on large scale numbers. So if I flip it 100,000 times, I should get really close to 50,000 heads and 50,000 tails. But if I just do it twice, it doesn't mean I have to get one of each. It's not like when you have a 50-50 shot at boys and girls that families with two kids are always a boy and a girl. What you see is some families have two girls, some families have two boys, and some families obviously are split. So understand that probability is the odds of each time. And If you have a boy, there's still a 50-50 shot. It doesn't affect that. And so you can keep doing it each time you may or may not get it. So with this idea of probability, keep in mind that that's really focusing on what you'd see as a whole in large scale. Don't get caught up if I say you have four kids and there's a three to one odds here. Don't tell me, well then three of them should always have this trait and one should always have this. That's not actually gonna happen in real life. It's gonna be more if you have a huge sample set that it'd be like three million have this and one million have this. Now for probability, the other idea is understanding how I'm expressing it. So I can say 50-50, I can say two out of four, I can say 50%, I can say one to one, one half. All of these are the same thing. It's just different ways of me expressing this idea that there's a 50-50 shot. You know, when I say one to one, the idea here is there's two possibilities, so it's really saying one half to one half. So don't freak out when you see the colon. And then obviously two out of four is one half. We've just simplified the fraction. If I say 50%, it's no different. So you'll see a lot of times I might interchange these or I might ask you for a percent. Sometimes I'll just say, give me a probability. And I don't care if you say it's, you know, one fourth, or if you decide to say it's one to three or whatever you want to come up with. As long as it means the correct thing, we're good. And so you can see like Mendel's ratio of three to one, that can also be stated as three quarters versus one quarter, 75%, 25% all the same thing, it's just different ways of getting across the same information. Now, Punnett squares are where we're at next, where Punnett squares are kind of a fairly easy way for us to structure things. So if we know the parents and what their genotypes were, we can essentially calculate and predict what the offspring's likely genotypes and phenotypes will be. Now, once again, these are the ratios that we would expect with a large sample size. So don't sit there and freak out if you do things four times and you don't get the exact same results of the four boxes. So starting off, we're just going to look at a single trait. So one trait at a time. And when we do this, you're going to see the top and the sides are going to be our potential gametes. So one of the parents had a big A and little a, so it can give either the little a or the big A via either the egg or the sperm. The other parent is homozygous recessive, so it can give just a little a. It can obviously give you know, the first little a or the second, but overall it doesn't really matter. It's going to be a little a. So we then put those in the top and on the left-hand side, and then we just fill in the boxes where they intersect. So this little a will be in these two boxes, the top two boxes. And then the first big A that's up on the top, that one's going to go straight down and fill in the boxes. So what you see here now is we have two of our four total are going to be heterozygotes. If we're talking, that's genotypically, phenotypically, two out of the four are going to be dominant. Whatever the dominant trait is, doesn't really matter. Two of the individuals are going to be homozygous recessive, so two out of four will be homozygous recessive or just phenotypically recessive. Now, once again, I could write that this is a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-two -two ratio means the same thing. I could say it's 50-50. That's up to you guys how exactly you want to do it. I'm just going to look, is it, does it make sense? I'm not going to sit there and tell you you have to reduce your fractions or something. Uh, unless it's a multiple choice problem where I'm giving you a choice that's reduced or not reduced, where you have to figure that out. Otherwise, I don't care. It's not going to bug me. Now, this is the simplest type of Punnett square that we can have, where I take the parents, write out what their stuff is, 
whatever their first letter of their genotype is, put it over the first side. Whatever the second letter is, put it over the second side. Do it both times. Pretty straightforward. The more complex one that we're going to kind of wrap up with is if you're looking at two traits at once. So Mendel did some research where he did dye hybrid crosses. So you know it was like in this case it's showing big S little s, big B little b. And so when he crosses two individuals that have that, we have to figure out what are their gametes going to be. And what a lot of people want to do, which gets them in trouble, is they want to just say, well, big S, little s, big B, little b, just like we did in the last one. But that's wrong. You have to pass on one S and one B. And so what we're going to do here is what you might have remembered from math, where it's essentially foiling. So that's where you take the first guy, this big S, and you put him with both of the potential Bs. So I can essentially have big S and big B. I can have big S and little b. Then I take the little s, my second guy, and put him with both of the possible b's. So little s, big b, little s, little b. So if you look up at the top here, you can see the potential sperm is what we're using as an example. Can be big s, big b, we have that. It can be big s, little b, we have that. Little s, big b, there we go. And then little s, little b. So when we're doing this, that FOIL method, that idea of the first guy with a third and fourth, and the second guy with a third and fourth, that's the best way to make sure you get this right. Under no circumstances should your offspring not look like the parents. And what I mean by that is if you did screw this up and so you just wrote like big S, little s, big B, little b, one by one, you'd notice your offspring are going to be stuff like big S, big S with no b's at all. That should be a red flag that you've done something horribly wrong. Now, for the other parents, or in some other scenarios, I guess we can say, you might have things where it's like little s, little s, big B, little b, we'll say. Don't freak out. It's OK to have where a lot of your gametes are the same. So in this case, we're going to have little s, big B, and we're going to have little s, little b. And then the other one's going to be the same idea. It's going to be little s, big B, and it's going to be little s, little b. So you'll notice that we only have two different types of gametes. And so when we're writing this out, if we were setting up another Punnett square that's going to have 16 boxes to make it all fit. Uh, so if we're setting up another one that's set up for like a dual trait or dihybrid scenario, you'll notice that sometimes you might have it where there's duplicates. Uh, in some cases, if you have like little s, little s, little b, little b, all the gametes will actually have the same. So you'll just write little s, little b four times off on the side here. That, that's OK. Just like in a monohybrid cross, if we're doing something that's just one trait, if somebody's big T, big T, you would set up your boxes and you just write big T over both. And nobody tends to freak out. Uh, so don't freak out if it's the same case with a dihybrid type cross where we're looking at two traits. Now, just to make sure we're clear, when I give you these Punnett square problems, I'm going to ask you usually for one of four things, but you have to pay attention to what or which one I'm asking for. So I might ask you for a specific phenotype, like saying, what's the probability they'll be tall? And so I'm expecting you to give me essentially like a percent or a fraction of how many are tall. I might ask you about specific genotype, where I could say, like, give me a percent for how many are heterozygous. I don't care about the homozygotes here. Just tell me two out of four or 50 percent or whatever it is are heterozygous. I can also say give me a phenotypic ratio where I want all the phenotypes. So if this is going to be a single trait thing, it's just going to be dominants and then recessives. If this was a dual trait thing, you're going to have dominant, 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 recessive. You guys should remember this now. And so there'll be four possible phenotypes. And then if I ask you for a genotypic ratio, I typically will only do this if it's a single trait Punnett square. I won't normally be cruel enough to make you do this. Uh, for most dual trait or dihybrid type crosses where there's 16 boxes to fill. Uh, if I do give you this though, what I'm usually expecting is you to tell me how many are homozygous dominant, how many are heterozygous, how many are homozygous recessive. You'll notice we typically always start with the dominant things in every scenario and work our way towards the recessive ones.